for years then we haven't even copyrighted our material we allow people to copy it to give it away that's what we want there's no doubt dinosaurs have gone soft okay my amateur audience you've got exactly seven seconds to stop giggling about that starting now I had plans all set to continue covering early session Creation Today episodes when I saw the alert that Eric Hovind was going live on YouTube. So of course I immediately dropped what I was doing to check out his feature length epic hangout. My name is Eric Hovind. I realize this is a very controversial issue. We've got people on both sides of the equation of what they think about the whole dinosaur soft tissue and what's going on with it. Really? This is a first for you. You're going to host some kind of old earth, young earth debate to see who has the best information? No wonder you went live. So I'm really excited that you guys are joining us here on this webinar because I've got some guys that have been studying this for a long time and they really know their stuff when it comes to dinosaur soft tissue. Oh, Genesis Apologetics Inc. and Institute for Creation Research. So when you said both sides, you meant like... Uh, what kind of music do you usually have here? Oh, we got both kinds. We got country and western. Then Eric went on to conduct a weather survey to bribe people to stay, host a 30-minute Bible study with scriptural defense of the historical accuracy of the Flintstones, and take timely, insightful questions from the chat group. Uh, real quick, I had somebody on the chat asking, hey, what's up with dinosaurs? When did it change from dragons to dinosaurs? Uh, now, eventually, you do plan to have dinosaurs on your, on your dinosaur tour, right? And you're about to share on these 14 different pieces of or different kinds of biomaterial that have been discovered. And, you know, I hope that this launches them on a journey of saying, okay, let me be real honest. What does this mean? Uh, right before you jump into that, I know you're going to do that. Uh, Dan. Oh, for Pete's sake, Eric, we have things to do. Let's cut to the chase. Brian is going to spitfire 14 claims designed to overwhelm a lay person with familiar sounding, but not understood sciencey words to create the impression of overwhelming evidence. In actual fact, each of the 14 will be merely minor variations of the same loop, a deliberate overstatement of a scientific find, an appeal to imagine timer that somehow establishes maximum survival time regardless of conditions and circumstance, which leads to a short earth conclusion drawn as clumsily as an angry toddler's fridge bait. Uh, we have 14 timers that are still ticking. They're like egg timers. You know, you, 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 you take your egg timer and uh, you, twi you twist it all the way, and then 60 minutes later, the thing goes ding and it stops ticking. Eric and his team have a conclusion they reached long before evidence was examined. So I hold that God's word, the Bible, is absolutely true. This is our authority. And the Bible teaches that God made the world about 6,000 years ago. And so I'm going to look at all this dinosaur soft tissue through this lens. While the phrase soft tissue may conjure up juicy hunks of dinosaur steak dripping in crimson blood pools, we're really talking about fragments of fragments of remnants. On behalf of science, which is totally in my power, I will concede and celebrate that amazing research in the past 20 years has found a variety of formerly biological material and fossils. The scientific community also estimates the time from point A to point B, some 65 or more million years. Was this number handed down from some authority? No, it is the unambiguous convergent consensus of an array of methodologies, including thermal luminescence, paleomagnetism, fission track, biochronology, electron spin resonance, magnetostratigraphy, and dozens of independent radiometric dating methods. They're not questioning the age of the dinosaurs, which I think they should be. Here's the thing, Eric. Science is absolutely open to being corrected by new evidence. But when one has a large data set of consistent points from many sources, and then a few unconfirmed outliers from even fewer sources, the wise course of action is to assume neither. They're asking, how did this last 65 million years old? That's the only rational question one can ask. Any hypothesis worth defending must account for all known data. How could you affirm the claim of a few thousand years without asking all the questions? Does your conclusion need to be protected from discoveries? Whatever. Let's get started. The first one is blood vessels. You wouldn't think that blood vessels would last for millions of years. I know we're in a hurry here, but you put Mary Schweitzer's name on the slide and you're not going to talk about her? Not only is she the renowned paleontologist who is most associated with this entire field of fossilized tissue study, but she's publicly a devout Christian. That's the exciting part for me. I've always been very intrigued by how, uh, how things change in going from a living being to part of the rock record. And 
Um, like I said, a lot of our science doesn't allow for this. All of the chemistry and all of the molecular breakdown experiments that we've done don't allow for this. Here we so go. If this material turns out to be actual remnants of the dinosaur, then yes, I think we will have to do some, um, certainly rethinking of some of the basics of the age of the fossils. She's going to say we need to rethink the age of the fossils. Rethinking of some of the basics of the model of fossilization. Wait, what? And I get excited every time. I can't help it. I mean, 80 million years old. Ouch. That's a tough break from the Christian scientist who made this discovery in the first place. At least she'll back you up on the veracity of the blood vessel claim. I think that it's important to remember that we, we don't know for sure what it still is. It looks like blood vessels, but we haven't done the chemical analysis that let us say what it is for sure. I'm sorry, Brian. You were saying? Blood vessels are made of um, um, flattened skin cells, epithelial cells, and those are mostly, they're like skin cells, and um, uh, they're made mostly of collagen protein. And scientists have measured the decay rate of collagen protein and found that it doesn't last any longer than about 900,000 years. So um, you can find references to, to the decay rates in, uh, in our, on our website, icr.org. A thousand years is a very short time. Now I love to check references, so I went to Brian's site looking for collagen decay rates as he suggested. There were no articles called that, but everywhere collagen is referenced links to this page. It quotes a biochemistry textbook. Not as good as a technical study, but we'll roll with it. That textbook says, In absence of a catalyst, the half-life for the hydrolysis of a typical peptide at neutral pH is estimated to be between 10 and 1,000 years. Now, Brian, you said a full disappearance by 1,000 years. A half-life is how long it takes for half of the substance to decay. Another 1,000 for half of that, another 1,000 for half of that, and so on and so on. And that's assuming the absence of a catalyst, assuming neutral pH, and wait, that's not even for collagen. That's for a typical peptide. In fact, collagen is anything but typical. It has a triple helix shape, which means three protein chains intertwining around each other. And there are two separate kind of reinforcements holding the strands together, multiple hydrogen bonds up and down the chain, and then at the end of the triple helix, there are crosslinks further holding it together. Cellular biochemists, even prominent Christian ones, find 68 million year survival of robust collagen protected in bone matrix to be very reasonable. Oh well, that's one clock off the wall. Another material that um, made it into the scientific literature, and here's from the journal Science in 2005, you can see um, blood cell, well, what, what some call a, a blood cell-like element. You had to clarify from blood cell to blood cell-like element? But it's circular, it's red, and it has hemoglobin in it. Here's the 2005 study you mentioned, also by Mary Schweitzer. It does not contain the phrase blood cell, but rather small round microstructures. Now hemoglobin is a combination of the heme group that bonds the iron atom and the globin, which is the protein part. It is the iron atom held in place by the heme group that binds and holds oxygen molecules for transport in the blood. This heme portion is more stable than the globin, and it is the heme portion only that Schweitzer's team found, and residual iron, not full hemoglobin, as you just misstated. And they're just the right size and shape to, uh, and color um, to identify as blood cells. The color is good enough for you, Brian? You do know that it is the non-decaying iron part that gives the blood its color, right? and that iron portion stays in the original size and shape as the rest decays? Now this is after the bone has been demineralized in acid. So they take the hard part away and all, all that's left is the proteins and the cells, if there is any, and it turns out there is some left in some of these bones, some of these uh, fossil bones. Schweitzer followed up with a research study that demonstrated the effect of natural iron concentrations on the preservation of organic material. That was even in the Jurassic Park movie, the latest one that came out, they tried to have an explanation for the iron preservation put right in the movie script. Did you know at the time is that the soft tissue is preserved because the iron in the dinosaur's blood generates free radicals? Those are highly reactive. So the proteins and the cell membranes get all mixed up and, 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 and uh, act as a natural preservative. DNA can survive for millennia that way. Dan. You propose that molecular biologists were lobbying the Jurassic World writers to leverage the movie to add credibility to science and not the other way around? Don't answer that. A third biomaterial uh, is uh, hemoglobin. And so if you look inside of a red blood cell, that's what you would find is um, many thousands of these proteins. I remember um, 
reading a paper that was about the evolution of a uh, of a mosasaur, and the authors of the paper published in PLOS One in 2011 said, Found it. Um, there's also a little red patch in the chest cavity, and we think it may be the remains. In fact, we tested it and discovered that it's, it's got hemoglobin in it. No, Brian. What they found was compounds suggestive of the presence of hemoglobin decomposition products. Now, when hemoglobin decomposes, it separates into two substances, a colorless material containing the decomposed globin, or protein part of the hemoglobin, and a blackish-red staining material containing all the hemoglobin's iron. So the hemoglobin portion was already gone, decomposed long ago. You accepted the parts of the study you liked, but ignored the minerals commonly associated with the exceptional soft tissue preservation. Another timer down. Now, number four, fresh bone cells. So these are osteocytes. And here's a, an image of a triceratops horn with a tape measure being excavated from Hell Creek formation in Montana, and they demineralized the horn and published these images um, in 2013. Found it. You see these two blob looking uh, shapes with little uh, extensions coming off. Those are uh, philopodia from uh, osteocytes. The paper seems to back you up on that. There's no reason to think that these could last any longer than um, say something on the order of um, tens or maybe possibly hundreds of thousands of years. Kind of. The osteocytes you speak of typically live only hours or days after the death of the organism. So unless the triceratops was alive a few days ago, and mostly fossilized yesterday, there's some kind of unusual circumstance that needs to be explained for either worldview, thousands or millions. Number five, ovalbumin is found in, in egg yolk and uh, egg shell. Hey, thanks for including the reference to the paper. That makes my life easier. It doesn't last long. No, it does not. Ovalbumin is the most abundant protein in albumin, the scientific name for egg white. Ovalbumin converts quickly to S-ovalbumin, starting instantly at the time the egg is laid. Even in cold storage, the ovalbumin is almost entirely converted in six months. You do not want an omelet from six-month-old eggs. There's no reason to suggest it could last any longer than what protein decay studies um, point to, and that's thousands, not millions. You don't have to point to generic protein studies, Brian. Like the osteocytes in number four, this timer doesn't even last a year. Both 65 million and 6,000 are equally impossible. Either way, something out of the ordinary happened with these eggs. And so what's it doing in, a, um, in an Argentina dinosaur fossil eggshell? According to the very paper you listed as a source, to preserve these labile embryonic remains, the rate of mineral precipitation must have superseded post-mortem degradative processes, resulting in virtually instantaneous mineralization of soft tissues. But what we're looking at here is the fifth separate egg timer, and it's still ticking. It's not a timer, Brian. Under usual circumstances, these egg proteins last only months. So the survival requires scientific explanation, even if they're only 6,000 years old. And we see chitin uh, in lots of these amber fossils. The age assignments on some of these ambers are, are real high, you know, 100 million years. Amber? Amber is the one thing Jurassic Park did teach us about. But, uh, but again, there's no evidence that chitin can last even 1 million years. Oh? What is the accepted decay rate for chitin? Now there's no decay rate specifically for chitin that I know of, but there are decay rates for certain of these biomaterials, and by extension, we know what's happening with the chemistry. So by your own words, you have no decay rate for chitin in open air, much less in amber, but you're including it here because you claim to understand general chemistry? Chitin is composed primarily of a monosaccharide derivative of glucose, Basically just the sugar, not the same chemistry as proteins. Also, um, did anyone else notice that these are insects and not dinosaurs? Coincidentally, this webinar took place right after the very first dinosaur in amber published find. But that dinosaur tail had protofeathers, which lends strong evidence of dinosaur to bird evolution. So I somehow doubt you'll include it in future presentations. I've got this dinosaur bone. It's one of my favorite bones in my office. That's cool, I guess. How do you know it's a dinosaur bone? And it's just right out of the ground. It's still dirty. I haven't even cleaned it. You haven't cleaned it? Then how do you know it's from a dinosaur? So hang on, Brian. The bone that you just held up is a dinosaur bone. Yes. It is not mineralized, petrified. I mean, it's, it's actual bone. Right. It's like getting an old cow bone out of a field, except you're getting it out of the ground. If it's millions of years old, it doesn't look that, like that at all. Which makes me wonder who's telling you that your unwashed cow bone is a million years old. 
I couldn't find any research papers claiming unmineralized dinosaur bones, so I did a reverse image search on the picture on your slide and found a creation website had it associated with this article. But when I went to look for the article, I found it had been removed from all online editions of the publication. Digging a little deeper, the removal was likely tied to this dissension by Anthony Fiorillo, the co-author of the original papers upon which these Mori claims were based. He writes, The bones from the Liscone bone bed are remarkable, but they are indeed fossilized, and they are indeed permineralized. And, the Mori paper serves as a reminder that scientists are not only obligated to provide the supporting data for the conclusions, but they are also obligated to cite their sources accurately. Ouch. No wonder you skipped the science on this one and stuck to show and tell. Um, several studies have verified collagen protein a lot of different ways. Nope. Nope, nope. Your number one, blood vessels, was already entirely about collagen. You can't make a sandwich be exhibit A, then try to call the bread from that same sandwich exhibit H. Nope. Even sequenced it from T-Rex and from Hadrosaur collagen protein sequence. Fun fact, the research that you refer to found that the closest living match for the T-Rex collagen was ostrich collagen. Virtually identical. Funny you didn't mention that part. There's a couple studies that have shown or have um, discovered signatures of DNA in, um, in fossils that are designated millions of years. Does signatures of DNA mean not really DNA? Thanks for including references to the studies. Oh, another one of Mary Schweitzer's. I took the time to read it. The team is very careful to classify their findings as consistent with DNA. It makes a very strong case that this material was once DNA, but concedes that there was insufficient DNA present to validate its origin. But I'm with you, Brian, on your generous reading of this research. However, I'm wondering why you were maximally generous with the finding of DNA, but ignore the entire section on molecular mechanism of preservation and this section dismantling prior studies on the half-life of DNA. Are you picking and choosing? Science doesn't get to do that, Brian. It's all or nothing. Or skin pigments. This is a Psittacosaurus from China. It's a spectacular fossil, but you can see the, the UV lamp reflects brightly when it, um, when it bounces off of rock matrix, but when it hits flesh, um, like skin and bone, the, the UV light doesn't reflect the same way it reflects back with a dull image. So you can see that you're, you're not looking at mineral at all. This is, this is actual skin showing original melanin and keratin protein. I know you wanted to say skin here because that sounds particularly soft and delicate. But you came clean at the end there. They found melanin and keratin. Neither paper that you cite talks about the UV light thing, but ultraviolet absorption is a property of keratin, the substance you list. But here's the thing. Keratin makes hair nails, horns, and antlers. As a biological substance, only bone is tougher. These are keratin scales, not fleshy skin. The second paper you list couldn't say for certain what pigment material they found, but the authors suggest melanin specifically because of its resistance to degradation. Number 11, PHEX, and this is another protein that vertebrates have. Whoa, whoa, wait, this is the same study as number nine. The same find, all part of the DNA evidence, not a separate thing. I'll confess, I didn't actually know what PHEX was, but did you notice that in identifying the PHEX in the dinosaur cells, that the only antibody they had success with was one specific for avian osteocytes? If you accept this as PHEX evidence, you should probably also accept the dinosaurs turned to birds, and that's where they all went. Anyway, this histone protein, they found this in, in uh, um, dinosaur um, nuclei in, in bone cells, osteocytes. Uh, that's amazing. This is the same study again. How many times are you going to count the same find? The presence of histone H4 was the evidence for the DNA you claimed in number 9. Same fruit from the same tree. Proteins like this should have, should have fallen apart within just thousands of years based on what we know about the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics. Creationist bingo. Seriously, I'm going to have to do a second law of thermodynamics video soon. Okay, we're getting down to it. And the last one we're looking at, the second to last one is keratin. Another protein. This is in your um, fingernails and hair and also lizard scales. And so they found original keratin protein in, um, in this lizard scale. Once again, you're doubling up as we already spoke about keratin in number 10. You remember the substance that makes horns and antlers? This happens to be the substance where long-term survivability studies have been done. And they show that keratin survives deep time even in the harshest conditions. And then the last one is a protein called elastin. Again, bacteria don't make these, so bacteria can't explain it. Really? That's all you're going to say about this? 
And now I have to address your hit and run claim? Fine, you left the name of the study. Here it is, or at least the abstract. We see that the study found bone matrix, vessel proteins, and collagen. We've already addressed all of these. And if the study you cite doesn't include elastin in the abstract, I think we're good here. By the way, the reason Brian mentions bacteria is because an early hypothesis for the Schweitzer findings was that perhaps bacteria were active in the samples, leaving the residue we find. The scientific community itself rejected that explanation back in 2006, but most people don't know that. So it's easy for Bill to pretend he's attacking an actual argument. Okay, guys, so Bill is in the chat, and Bill says, you guys, the presenters, ignored scientific explanations for the preserved biomaterial. You haven't even talked about the scientific explanations for this. I didn't, Bill. I've got you covered. Well, of course, anyone can claim that we ignore this or that because we can't get to everything in one short <laughs> webinar. The webinar was almost an hour and a half, and you jammed the science claims into 17 minutes. Less than 22% of the time on air was spent on science. So why, why fault us for not being comprehensive when that's not at all our intent? I'm almost afraid to ask, but what was your intent? There's actually a lot more information you can get on this. And uh, Brian, you actually, you guys put together a DVD series on, on this topic specifically, didn't you? Did you guys trick me into watching an infomercial for creationist DVDs? Most of them are written by scientists and they have a language all their own. Yeah, I say they do. You guys in the webinar are going to get the uh, big old coupon for this. You're not a scientist, Mike. No, you got that right, Kim. <laughs> and they're TV quality. It'll cut through a branch and still remain razor sharp. Brian's got something even better for you. Festival? My husband doesn't snore anymore. Brian, you're going to give them a 20% discount. When you order the sticky, you get the little sticky. I'm going to grab something. I'm going to wrap it up for a present. How much would you pay for a knife like this? The answer is so many more questions. But if you call now, within the next 20 minutes, because we can't do this all day. He literally will ship out that DVD and ship out that book to you. Order right away. You'll get this convenient on-off switch. <laughs> you only get it if you watch this whole thing. Yes, it's our nice little hook for you. I guarantee it. Listen, forget all the science and debate we just had, here's the important takeaway. Eric and his presenters assert that science has 14 maximum life clocks over on this side, and that these clocks are true and real and accurate enough to overturn centuries of predictively flawless findings. Meanwhile, they also assert that these scientifically derived clocks over here, using the very same uniformitarian decay principles they profess are reliable on the other side, are somehow garbage, for some unspoken reason. These clocks might support my story, these clocks, not so much. They want you to pick and choose based on what you already believe. Okay, let me be real honest. What does this mean? Honest? I'm afraid honesty has eluded you once again, Eric. Maybe next week. If you like this video, and if you think YouTube should promote it to others, you can help that happen by giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down, subscribing to the Paul Gia channel, and leaving me a comment below. Unfortunately, that's just the way YouTube works now, but I do enjoy your feedback. Thanks for watching.